Welcome to the Broken Pie Chart Podcast, episode number 16. I'm your host, Derek Moore, and today we're going to be talking about Really, this is what you plan for with hedged equity and some of the attributes and aspects of that. And to help me unravel everything is Jay Pestercelli, the founder of Zega Financial and author of Buy and Hedge. Jay, how are you doing today? Great, Derek. Thanks for having me on again. Yeah, so it's kind of interesting. We've uh, we've been proponents of hedging for quite some time. And, and one of the main core strategies that we use and Zega uh, developed and used is the whole idea of buy and hedge, meaning... You buy the market and you've got some downside protection. You recently wrote an article and of course linked to that article. I'll also link to an article that I wrote on the Zega site about some of the fixed income piece. We'll get into all that. But you wrote an article and essentially you you said, look, this is what you plan for. We've seen some volatility in the market. And recently the headline was, hey, this is the worst December since the Great Depression. But Jay, hedging is sort of planning for these types of moves, right? Yeah, exactly. The reason you use a hedged portfolio is because you still believe in buying and and holding stock for the long term and the natural appreciation of the stock market. However, when you get negative years, kind of what we're experiencing right now, uh, you don't want to experience all that decline. And so you want to protect yourself. And that is exactly why we have always recommended hedging your investments uh, and being invested, but protected at the same time. And it's unfortunate that a lot of folks don't know about hedging strategies. I mean, I think people hear about hedge funds and assume, you know, risk on type vehicles that are actively trading and doing crazy things like owning pineapple farms and real estate in India. That's not what we're talking about at all. We're talking about hedging as in the term goes, hedging your bets, like protection, meaning you have something that's offsetting your core underlying investment thesis. And, you know, years like this is why we hedge. You know, you never know when uh, this type of an event or this type of a year is going to come. You know, if, if, if you asked me this question 12 months ago at the end of December last year, uh, everything seemed rosy. You got the tax credits kicking in. The U.S. is growing. Uh, the Fed is saying things look good. All that kind of stuff, and nobody would have expected, I don't think many expected, a down year for 2018. And it looks like that's what we're going to have. So, you know, hedging is one of those things we believe you should always be doing because timing the market is very difficult. Um, But, you know, we could get into the details about that in a moment, Derek. But yes, this is what we have planned for. This is why you've hedged when the market starts to do something, something like what we've seen here for this quarter, October, November, and the first half of December, dropping as much as it has. Yeah, and I think the the important point here, and, and I'll link to a previous episode where we went really in depth on on the buy and hedge strategy, but it's the whole idea that classic asset allocation, meaning you have some some different stuff across different spaces. Okay, I'm oversimplifying, but you got internationally, you got. U.S. equities, you got a little bit of bonds, but we know that that is, you hope that that works. It's not guaranteed to work. And Jay, recently I did an episode on the whole target date funds, which I think they're misunderstood still, but you know, a lot of people were surprised in 2008, a 2010 dated target fund, meaning you're going to retire in 2010. Some of those went down 50% or more. And so wow. the the goal of, you know, and by the way, target day funds do what they say they're going to do, but really the it's the whole idea of classic asset allocation doesn't, I mean, really, is it is it the right choice? But what we're talking about is having a defined downside in a portfolio. So if the market sells off materially, if you have a 50% peak to trough, the idea is to only have about, you know, 8 to 10% downside on the equity portion. And I always like to, and I, I've heard you say this as well, and you mentioned it in the article, it's sort of what you plan for. And because you've planned, you can sleep a little better at night. Yeah. You know, we've um, talked to a lot of folks that have nervousness about the markets, right? They've heard the headline that you just mentioned, worst December since the Great Depression. They've seen their accounts uh, drop from the all-time highs at the end of September. And folks just have a general nervousness about the market and the you know, inevitable recession. I almost say that sarcastically because yes, it's inevitable, just don't know when. Uh, And so we've seen that folks are nervous and my response has been, that's okay. That's why you've hedged. This is exactly 
the, the product or portfolio you've decided to use so that when this happens, you're prepared. Your portfolio is designed to withstand major market sell-offs. Now, fluctuations of seven, eight, nine percent within a portfolio, I think that's that's just generally accepted risk levels if you're going to be in the stock market, period, right? That's just, you have to be able to accept that kind of risk. But we lock in and put a floor in portfolios so that we aim to limit losses to never exceed eight or nine or 10% in any given year. And so when all of a sudden the market starts doing one of these quick sell offs uh, and folks get nervous, uh, they should be reminded and should find relief in the fact that you've prepared for this by adopting a hedged equity portfolio in the first place. I think this also talks about, and it gets to sort of where the market is, also affects people's, you know, quote unquote, risk tolerance. And what I mean by that is when the market's been up, 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 and you give somebody a risk questionnaire. And it, by the way, it's the job of, you know, advisors like us and the advisors that, that we work with, with their clients to sort of help them understand what their real risk is. But I think, you know, for a lot of years when the market's going up, people are more willing on a questionnaire to say, hey, I'm, I'm fine taking a lot of risk. But at the very moment when markets start to get more volatile, their sort of true risk tolerance comes out. And I remember after 2008, 2009, you talked to a client or a potential client and advisors told me this too, Jay. I mean, people were more apt to stay in cash. So I think, you know, and back then we would say, look, you, you need to be invested in the market. And even in June, July, August, September of this year, when markets were near the highs, we were saying, look, if you take away the largest part of the downside and you have sort of this risk-defined area, it really takes away one of the biggest fears for people. But it also, it also, Jay, stops people from trying to get the perfect entry in the market. You know, how many times do we hear the market's too high? I want to wait. Well, you know, people waiting in 2009 or 2010 missed out on many, many years. And so, yeah, it's, it's tough business time in the market like that, Derek, you're a hundred percent, right? It's tough. And the, you know, the other thing, and, and you and I have talked about this too, it's sort of like, if people have new money to work right now, you know, they're not early in this run. Uh, if we get to March of 2019, it would total or equal the the largest number of months between recessions. But it doesn't mean that people shouldn't be invested. It's just people and and you know investors out there can take a little bit of comfort in having a hedged downside, because look, if the market runs great, if it goes down, um, and maybe you can talk about this a little bit. It's the whole idea of hey, if you avoid the loss, like we've we've got some clients and advisors have some clients who want the market to go down because they want to avoid the loss and sort of like dollar cost in average cheaper, right? Yes, yes, that's a real interesting aspect of a hedged portfolio. And most people forget that part about it. Um, like you said, it's been, we're approaching the record uh, amount of time between recessions. And so it's been a while since the market's been down. And while I don't think people have forgot about the magnitude of 2008, I think they've forgot about their emotional state of 2008 and the tactics that should be applied around a 2008 or a 2000 right? Any one of these types of bear markets. And uh, I'll go, I'll, I'll jump right to the point that you're making. Um, and uh, it's a term and a, and a, I'll call a dynamic that we call the hedger's opportunity. So I'm going to give you a quick example, Derek, and we'll, we'll talk through it yeah, briefly. Let's, but let's do it. L- let, let's say uh, the market is down 30%, right? From the time that we got in. So let's say we got in at the exact wrong time, September 28th of 2018, and the market proceeds to go down 30% but we were hedged and only lost eight. You know, let's round to 10. Let's just say 10. And the market goes down 30. We have essentially avoided how much of the loss? 20%, 20%, right? Yep. And so what happens is as our hedges mature and expire, um, what we we take a look at the market and now we have 90% of what we started with, yet the market is at a uh, 30% discount at a 70% level. Well, we get to reinvest with 90% of our money in a market that is only carrying the value of 70% of when we started. And so what that means is we end up buying more of the market, more market share. In some cases, it's shares. In some cases, it's contracts. The, the details don't matter. But the fact that we avoided that 20%, we could put that right back to work. And as the market goes back up, we end up having 
believe it or not, the way the, the, the numbers work out, 25% more shares on the way up than we had on the way down. So if we had 100 on the way down, we have 125 on the way up. And as the market rebounds, eventually, we know markets always eventually rebound. They're designed to go up, and sometimes it takes longer than other times to go up. But as the market and when the market eventually rebounds, we will have earn 25% more on the way up than we had on the way down. So when everybody's just getting back to even, you know, if the market did a 30% sell-off, it needs a 43% to get back to even. You just gain 25% more than everybody else that just got back to even. And we call that the hedger's opportunity. And, you know, the, there there is that perverse incentive that you described where if you're hedged, you want the market to go down as far as it can go because you've stopped losing money at that 10% level. So wouldn't you rather buy at say a 40, 50 or a 60% discount than only, you know, a 30% discount? Yes, of course. So it's weird this dynamic that if we're going to lose in a hedged equity portfolio, um what we understand we take that 10% risk, but we want the market to go down much farther so our opportunity to buy at a larger discount exists. I hope I went through that pretty well. Maybe there's a different angle you want to help clarify there, Derek. But I mean, that's the that's the opportunity that comes along with hedging. And it only happens once every five to 10 years. It's been 10 years since we've had this chance, right? You need to take advantage of it. But I'll pass to you at this point, Derek. Yeah, I mean, I, to me, it brings really two different times in the markets. And I remember being on a, a trading desk in 1994 94, it had the volatility or like an EKG of a rock. It, the market just didn't go anywhere. But you think about the real bull market was 82 to, to, to 99. And I remember in 94, people on the street saying, look, we're too far into this bull market. It's too high. It's gone too far. You know, We're going to have a, a crash or recession. And actually what happened is it, it sort of based in 94 and then it made this huge move up into you know for the next five years. So in that case, okay, you have buy and hedge, you get most of the market return. You didn't have a crash. That's good. You get you get the upside. And really the counter to that is let's say somebody had invested in a buy and hedge uh, retirement strategy, right, per se, in September of 2007. 2007, uh, September was the the peak period of, of the market. And then, of course, it troughed, meaning the very lows in March of 2009. But somebody coming in and saying, look, I need to put new money to work. I'm going to put it in buy and hedge retirement. In that case, in theory, right? Okay, you experience the first 8 to 10% down. But depending upon when the, the vehicles matured, maybe they missed, you know, I mean, the market went down about 50, 55%. I'm not saying they would have bought back in at 55% down, but in theory, uh, they didn't participate in 45% of that. And so there's really those, that dichotomy of the two different opportunities. I mean, there's another one where markets go nowhere, but I mean, that's, that's really sort of, okay, you know, one hedge you, you win because you participated in most of the upside, tails, you sort of lose a defined amount, but then you sort of win because you get to buy back in a lot cheaper. Yeah, no doubt. And, you know, these days, um, you know, with the, the, the age of the majority of the population, certainly the baby boomer population, um, you know, they are at a stage where they don't have as many years to be invested in stock type assets. And so uh, even in retirement, listen, I think these days we plan for folks to live to 90. I know not everybody will, but nobody wants to run out at 80 because you only plan for 80. So folks that are even in their, you know, early 70s still have 20 years of investing to go. And, you know, sitting back in bonds for 20 years is at this point is barely going to offset inflation. And so you need some equity exposure, but you don't have the time to have a decade uh, that may be needed to recover from the highs that we saw in September, like we did, let's say from, you know, 2000. And then we had the, you know, the the 08 thing. It took a decade there of recovery. And so protecting assets um, because your time is shorter is even more important for the folks who, quite frankly, have more assets. And so when I think about who the strategy it's appropriate for is those folks that know they need some stock exposure because there just isn't the growth in bonds, um, yet they can't withstand, they can't handle a minus 40, minus 50 like we saw in 08. So, you know, the strategy really is appropriate for those folks that uh, realize I need growth, but I can't take the risk. And that's a great thing about the strategy. 
uh, especially about why you hedge in the first place is when you get a year like this that, you know, has the potential to be down, uh, you want to have some protection in place. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking about, so Jeremy Siegel wrote a book called The The Case for Stocks. I might be might be botching the title and my apologies to uh, Professor Siegel. But one of the things he had in there, uh, the, the print that uh, I think was printed in 95 or towards the end of uh, the 90s, he had this stat. It was since the 1800s. Um, you had these periods where real return in bonds, meaning your return minus inflation is your real return, w- was okay. But then over the last 100 years, bonds have actually returned, and I think he had this in the book, uh, 0.2% real return, meaning you were getting 0.2% annualized return above inflation. And so we'll get to sort of how we use bonds as a funding source. But I think your point's well taken, Jay, when you say, look, you, you can't really sit in bonds, especially at these yields, and expect to get any sort of growth. I mean, you need stocks. But as you said, I mean, you can't take uh, material loss because you just never get it back. And, you know, the other thing I was thinking, when, you know, this, this is, uh, we'll see, like you said, we're going to have a recession at some point, but it is interesting. You know, if I said, hey, do you remember the great recession of 1991 or 1992? You'd probably say, I don't even remember that recession. Not all recessions are as deep and, and hard and fast as, right. as, you know, the, the 2008 experience. But I got to tell you, it seems like everyone is telling us that there's going to be a recession sometime in 2019 or 2020. And I got to tell you, when everyone says something, typically it doesn't happen. Uh, I think this year is an exact example of that, Derek, right? The, everybody thought this would be a great year. And January started out gangbusters. Uh, and look where we are today from that January point. So I agree the the crowd consensus is rarely the, the natural outcome of the markets. Uh, and so all of this anticipation of pricing in a recession, you know, may or may not be right. The great thing about buying hedges, you don't have to be right on the underlying thesis of which way the market's going to go by when. Being invested and being hedged uh, allows you to make money if the market's going to be good and limit your losses if it turns out this was the wrong time to put money to work. You know, it's it, it does take the, you know, the timing out of the market for sure. And hopefully the emotion as well. And I think you made that point in the article uh, titled What You Plan For. Of course, I'll link to that. But I think that's one of the points that you made as well. If you can take the emotion and the fear and the anxiety, I mean, you know, part of the people who use this strategy and the advisors who use it for their clients, including me, uh, really, you know, they don't want their clients to, to quote unquote, freak out when the market's down because they say, well, look, I have, I have protection on the downside. And so, and like, and you just described that perverse thing where, some people actually, and by the way, I never know which it is, Jay, when I talk to somebody. Some people say, look, I just want the market to go up, up, and up. Other people say, well, wouldn't it be great if it really went down? Because I would only take this much amount of loss and I get to buy back in. But, you know, it, it's, and I don't know about you, Jay, but I never know which people, which way people are going to go. But it's, <laughs> it's sort of interesting the way that, that works out. Yeah, you know, and e- even though I realize that the opportunity for our clients and our advisors uh, in the long run is a deeper drop in the market, um, we we all still feel that emotional tug, right? It's like, oh, it's bad again. And I feel like, you know, even myself, I have to remind myself, yeah, okay, that's okay. You know, um, though, if it gets really bad, we have a better opportunity, right, to get in lower with our uh, avoided losses. Um, I, I uh, you know, you mentioned emotion. Um, we have two chapters in the Buy and Hedge book about emotion. And it all comes back to, you know, have you ever made a decision where you said to yourself afterwards, gosh, I wish I was more emotional when I made that decision? Right? You just don't. <laughs> it just, yeah, probably, no, right? probably not. So, probably not. Uh, you know, like being able to remove emotion from the decision process is important. And when you can manage your risk and you know, you know, your downside floor is defined out of the gate, it certainly helps reduce some of that emotional uh, reaction. Let's face it, the market is driven by two emotions, fear and greed. Fear is a faster and more, uh, uh, I'll say, you know, uh, uh, peaking emotion than greed. Fear, you know, drives people to sell and go to cash right away and then wait. Um, It allows them to feel like they've made the right decision. Uh, when in all honesty, they probably sold while the market was already lower, you know, um, 
But it's one of those things that uh, taking emotion out is very, very important. And buying hedge really helps you do that. It really does. And I think, you know, reminding folks that, hey, this is the whole reason you used the hedged equity in the first place so that when this happens, you're well positioned for it and you didn't have to time, go to cash, risk on, risk off. It's much better to be risk managed. Of course, buy and hedge retirement has the idea of having a floor in the portfolio and, and that floor is sort of achieved because using options to control but not own shares of the market, you are limited to the amount that you pay with the option. Um, and I'll, I'll just, we're talking about buy and hedge, but I will mention as well for clients in ZBIG, which is the buffered index growth strategy, uh, it's sort of, you know, the risk is different. And so instead of a floor, there's a buffer on the first 25% down on equity losses. But the point is salient in both. That's why you use that because whether it's a buffer, whether it's a hedge and a floor, uh, you want to be in the market. But if things don't work out, you've got either a buffer or a hedge. And But, you know, I'll transition to sort of the fixed income. And I, I sort of started right. to tease it. I mean, for a little bit of money, usually right around seven or eight, I'm talking about buying hedge retirement now, seven or eight percent, it costs to buy the the option. And the great thing about options is what you put into that option, that's what you can lose. And that's a risk defined trade. The problem though, Jay, is that if you're in a flat market, if you're going to lose seven or eight percent in a flat market, that starts to create too much erosion. The cost of hedging is a little bit too expensive. And so for the 93% or so of the account, it's actually using bonds. And I know we just said, wait, wait a second. I mean, bonds really aren't offering you much of a real return, but you're using funds, Jay, as a funds, uh, you're using bonds as a funding source to reduce the cost to hedging. And really what you're doing is shifting from an equity risk, which would be the case if you were, let's say, 100% into stocks, vis-a-vis the, the SPY or something else, to a fixed income type risk profile, which of course is much less volatile. Yeah, that's exactly right, Derek. Think about, uh, you know, we talk about hedging and, and while it's not an insurance product, it's like buying insurance. We we all hedge, we all buy insurance, whether it's your car, health insurance, homeowners insurance, renters insurance. We all, we all buy insurance. We're all familiar with the concept that there is a premium that you must pay to be insured. Insurance isn't free. And we try to manage the cost of that insurance um, by uh, using some fixed income vehicles for some level of income. We actually target in our buy and hedge portfolio, buy and hedge retirement portfolio, three and a half to 4% income from that portion of the portfolio. And that is used to help offset the cost of being hedged in the market. And uh, you're right, we use a combination of uh, treasuries. We use a combination of uh, some high short duration, high yield. We hedge that a little bit. We actually are starting to use a little bit of an opportunistic fund that uh, takes advantage of some of the ebbs and flows within the fixed income market. But the goal of that portion of the portfolio is to return three and a half to four percent per year, and that income helps supplement the cost of that hedged market position that we have, and. You know, there are times where that actual income portion of the portfolio carries a little bit of its own risk. Uh, this year, uh, I think that portion of our portfolio is probably up two, two and a half uh, percent. And so, you know, when you come in under your three and a half percent target, uh, you are going to experience a slightly greater cost of hedging. But it doesn't diminish. The benefits of hedging, right? Your max loss is still the same. We don't change the amount of stock exposure you have. We're just changing a little bit of the income piece that helps offset some of that cost of hedging. Does that kind of touch on the, the high level information, Derek, about the fixed income portion? No, exactly, Jay. And, and I think, you know, when we think about this, let's say it cost on a million dollar account, you need to spend about 70000 to to use options to control but not own shares. So you get what's called notional value. You get to participate in the upside of the market. But if you're if you get a return of 4%, so that's 7% of the account. If you get a return of 4%, well, then your cost goes down to 3%. And that, that's really interesting. That's uh, it really lowers your cost. But of course, there is a little bit of risk in fi- fixed income. Um, this year, right, we've seen a total return 
that is less than the forecasted 4%. And so if you only get 2% of a total return, then instead of you know your cost of hedging at 3%, okay, well, now your cost of hedging at 5%. And so in a year like this, you actually get, I don't want to call it a drag, uh, but it didn't quite give you the, the same type of income. And so you're still hedged, you still have all the benefits. It just, it was a little bit more costly in the end. Yeah. And you know, the vehicles that we use, that that's exactly right, Derek. The vehicles that we use um, are all intended to be held to maturity. And so for those of you that understand how bonds work, um, our intention is that the money we put into the bonds gets paid back to us when they mature. Um, we are intra maturity. Maybe that's, I don't know if that's a term or not. Well, we haven't, you know, the bonds haven't matured enough. And so when the fixed income market, certainly the credit market experiences some level of pricing pressure, meaning there's some fear in the credit market, um, our positions will reflect some of those uh, price pressure. I'm going to say pricing declines um, before they mature. But the point is we put on positions that have shorter duration in a targeted area. So we don't have to wait too much to get too long to get our money back. Um, and, you know, there is a chance that as the products begin to mature, their prices will appreciate. And so just as you mentioned that we may experience kind of a decline in, you know, say month or one year performance because the bonds, you know, didn't deliver 4%. In other years, they may deliver excess returns than that 4% because they're underlying appreciated. But over time, the portfolios that we build have historically delivered 4% or more. And, you know, we are longer term investors here, right? We talk about years, two years, three years in our time frame, not, you know, two months, three month time frames when it comes to our fixed income investing. And so, yes, I think the point is, hey, the bonds may reflect a little bit of pricing pressure in the in the credit markets, but the vehicles we've picked um, have A, outperformed the rest of the fixed income market, and B, are shorter duration in nature, which is certainly the safer end of the curve. So we, we don't... Um, have a lot of anxiety over those positions, but certainly when you look at, you know, monthly statements, they may reflect a little bit of pressure. Yeah. And, and thinking about this, imagine if we just use one bond, just one bond in the portfolio, right? Of course, the, we're using vehicles with many, many bonds to spread the risk about, but a bond gets issued to what's called par value or a thousand dollars. And so if your coupon, meaning what you're going to get every year is 5%, uh, your bond is a thousand dollars. That's the market value. You're getting paid monthly dividends, which should equal out to 5%. But as you described, Jay, if there's a little bit of pressure, short-term pressure in the market, and the market value goes down 2%, well, now your bond is worth $980. Well, when it matures, let's say next December, the idea is, uh, barring any defaults, which um, you know really is the, the overriding risk, but uh, the company uh, you know pays out the dividend, and then it pays back the $1,000 at par value. And so what you're describing is sort of a a decline mid, or I, I'm going to use your word, intra-maturity, meaning while the bond is still active and paying interest. And so when people look at their statements, they might say, oh, okay, well, I see the market is down, and but I also see a little bit of downside from the bonds. What you're seeing is this intra-maturity difference in pricing. But the idea, as you said, Jay, is you're holding these to maturity. And as you get closer to maturity, any sort of dislocation in price should correct back up to par value. Yeah, and let, let's let's talk about defaults for a moment because you mentioned that, and that really is um, uh, there's there's two risks when it comes to bonds and bond portfolios. It's interest rate risk and default risk. And I'm going to say default and credit risk. Kind of, I'm going to lump them together. Um, interest rate risk when you hold to maturity isn't going to be an issue for you uh, because as long as you get back the money that you lent to lent initially then you know you don't care how interest rates moved you got your payments the whole time and you got your money back great that's why we do the hold to maturity and short duration treasuries um so let's talk about the default risk for a moment because that is the risk that we take that all of a sudden you don't get paid back what you expected at maturity well we realize that defaults happen they happen all the time um and there are some environments where defaults are excessive like 2008 there are a lot of defaults in the in the in the high yield market. So we actually realize that and because it's a hedged equity portfolio, we even hedge our high yield against defaults. And so we put positions on that are also hedging that. And so while we we are willing to pay an extra 1% against something that's yielding 5 and a half, 6% to protect it 
because again, all I'm shooting for is a net four, three and a half to four percent total. So I'm okay spending a little money on hedging that default risk. Uh, again, there's some wiggle room. We don't hedge, you know, right at the exact value. We 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 you know we take a little bit of risk there for the reward we're getting, but we still do protect against the default aspect of the portfolio as well. And so if the broad market, short and long and midterm duration uh, vehicles, you know, start to experience price declines due to defaults, well, you know what? We put protection in against that too. Yeah. So you're hedging and you're hedging the hedges. And <laughs> that's that's why, you know, if the market goes up 20% and you capture 15%, which by my math and back of the napkin calculations is 75% of the upside. Good job on that. Uh, yeah, there. <laughs> I practiced that, Jay. Uh, but but that's uh, that's why when markets go up a lot, and you look at your statement, and say, wait a second, the market went up twenty percent, but I only made fifteen. Well, you're hedged, and we put a lot of protection in, right? We are definitely trying to give you the the insurance type aspect to your portfolio. You know, um, if I can make one comment again about the emotional status of the market, Derek, and I know we're talking about fixed income, but I think it all wraps together. Um, you know, nobody ever likes to use insurance. We have it. If you have a car accident, you don't like to use it. It means something bad happened for you, right? Um, and so we realize the emotional uh, uh, disposition during a down market is going to be negative because the fact you need insurance on your portfolio means something bad is happening. Um, but you know what? You're glad you have it when you go to your insurance agent and cash it in and say, hey, my car got totaled or, you know, my house got hit by a I'm going to use a sandstorm for you out in Arizona. I'm done using hurricane <laughs> examples. We had a dramatic sandstorm. Uh, you know, something like that happens. Uh, you know, it's never good. It's an inconvenience. Uh, there's still some cost. There's always some pain when you have to use your insurance. But if it's excessive, you're going to be glad you had it. You just paid for your policy. Hopefully, eventually, with, with the avoided, with the avoided state. <laughs> yes, that's true. That's true. I'm not sure the ratio of people that actually, you know, benefit, like get the better side of the insurance company. You know, I think most people end up are net payers against their insurance. Uh, you know, this I've heard the stat: one out of every, you know, five thousand people get one over on the insurance company, which means the insurance company wins four thousand nine hundred ninety nine times. But you're still glad you had it because. You may not have the cash to put out to buy a new roof or, you know, replace, you know, walls that have, with damage. Yeah. You, you don't get, if you had a Mercedes, you don't get two Mercedes on the way back up. Like you get more shares in the market. If it goes down, you avoid the loss. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's true. You know, if all Mercedes went down in price together, but yours didn't go down as much, you might be able to sell that Mercedes for a higher price and then buy two. But that's every Mercedes has to go down in that scenario. Which, by the way, uh, that really doesn't ever happen. So it's not a one-to-one -one example where the market gives you a hedging opportunity that your insurance does not. <laughs> All right, folks. Well, I think you could you could have stopped listening to this at minute thirty-two, and uh, we would have <laughs> anyway. <laughs> the key is uh, you got insurance. This is what you plan for. If you have this. Hopefully you're you're just feeling a little less anxiety, and, and uh, if markets go up, great. If markets go down, yeah, protection. Well, Jay, with that, I think we'll uh, we'll call it here. And thanks again for coming on. I will link to the the articles. I thought you did a good job with that one, and I know you helped me with the the one I wrote on the fixed income piece. So we'll link to that. You mentioned the book Buy and Hedge, of course, which is the uh, the book that describes the strategy in depth. So we'll we'll link to that as well. And uh, Jay, uh, hopefully everyone has uh, a good Christmas, right? Yeah, same to you, Derek. Hope uh, everybody in your house is feeling better. All right, Jay. Thanks. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.